Hello, and welcome to Worship with Christ Lutheran Church. We're so glad you're with us today. Whether you're streaming or listening in on the radio, we're glad you decided to join us. And happy Mother's Day to all of you moms tuning in as well. We hope your day is blessed, and we honor you today. So we also wanted to welcome those that are worshiping out in our parking lot this morning. It is so fun to be able to be together once again, uh, but we do ask that you be respectful of social distancing. Uh, we know everybody wants to hug on each other, but please respect that so we can keep everybody safe and we also know you want to socialize, so there will be plenty of time to do that after our worship time together as well. So let's begin by praising our Lord and Savior. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. We begin our worship today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's confess our sins together before the Lord. Lord, today we recognize our lack of faith. We have not kept our eyes on you, and we have been distracted by the sights around us. We have been listening to other voices which beg us to crawl inward and self-destruct. Today, as we hear your call to come, give us faith so we need not be afraid. Forgive our sins. Today, we can celebrate faith because our God gives us faith for every purpose and strength for every need. Our God sent Jesus to the cross to die in our place so that our lives could have eternal value. Our God has forgiven our sin through Jesus and our response to that love are lives that are grounded in faith and powered by service. Our faith is a gift. Our life is a gift. Our eternal life is a gift from our loving God. Praise God for the gift of faith. Generations, for oh, the Lord is good and is mercy. 
darkness fills our hearts to overflowing. Songs of rejoicing and sweet praise. Yeah. 
is no greater truth than this. There is no stronger love we know. God himself comes down to live and makes the sinner's heart his own. There is no deeper peace than this. No other kindness can compare. He clothes us in his righteousness, forever free, forever air. Oh, praise the only one who shines brighter than ten thousand suns. Health and hell call him victorious. Praise him. sweeter joy than this. There is no stronger hope we hold. We are His forevermore, safe, secure by Christ alone. Oh, praise the only one who shines brighter than ten thousand suns. Death and hell call him victorious, praise him. Oh, praise the one true king, lifted loud till earth and heaven ring. Every crown we lay down at his feet, praise him, praise him. Father, thank you for your faithfulness through every circumstance. We praise you, our unchanging and steadfast God. We pray that we would learn how to live in your strength and be ready to cross the Jordan in whatever ways that command manifests itself in our lives. Help us to open our minds and hearts to your vision and not limit what you want to do in and through us by letting fear or anxiety overwhelm us. You have called us to be strong and courageous in following you. Help us to learn how to do this as we step out in faith and trust you more deeply each step along the way. In Jesus' name we pray, 
Amen. And now it's time for the children's message. Well, hi there, kids. It's different meeting you like this, but soon we'll be able to be together again. So whether you regularly attend CLC or you're just visiting us online, we welcome you because this is our time to focus on children and youth. And you know, Jesus did that a lot himself. He referred to children many times when he was here on earth. He used their pure, ready-to-go, excitable way of seeing things and receiving things to describe ways that we can approach some big ideas. One of today's scriptures does just that. In Matthew eleven twenty five through 26, the Bible says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Isn't that cool? God was happy to tell special things to people who were willing to learn and hear what he has to say to the children. Though Jesus, through Jesus, we have that special connection with God. Us adults, we can learn something from you kids. But that's not how it usually works, is it? Do adults go to kids for answers? Or do you go to adults for answers, like teachers and parents? Well, yep, you usually go to adults, but like many things that Jesus points out, that's not how he always does things, not the normal way anyway. He says that the faith, trust, and gratitude of a child is the very thing that we need to have. So you got something figured out. Through Jesus, we can come to God, and it's so cool because... That actually pleases him, that he gets to reveal that to you. Well, just a few verses later, he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, I just love these verses too. Jesus invites us to come to him. Would you run to him if he called you to come? Well, he's calling all who are tired and stressed and struggling. Have you been struggling during this time? Things sure are different at home, aren't they? But Jesus is always the same. We can run to him, and he promises here in this verse that we will find rest when we're tired and struggling. Do you know what I picture? I picture a parent opening up their arms, welping, welcoming a child, to come and sit next to them, or if you're small, it's even still sit on their lap. I know I still like to do that with my mom. Can you picture it too? And, and can you just feel that, the peace that you get when you come and sit by your mom or dad? And maybe you could even bring your stuffed animal too, or maybe even your blanket and come and just sit and snuggle with them. I do still sleep with my blanket at night. I pull it up around my neck in the winter and keep me warm. So I like that snuggly feeling too. And whoo, static. Anyway, you just get to sit there and all the things that are bothering you just kind of melt away. And Jesus says he can lift those heavy things that are on you and lift them off. And you become lighter at heart and that um, hard stuff just goes away. And he takes it on himself. He even says it's easy for him. So awesome. So two things. First, that God loves you. And he's excited to reveal those things to you because you have faith, the faith of a child. He invites you to come, to come and jump on his lap or sit next to him so that he can take all those things you're struggling with and he can take it on himself. You can do this by, re we can do this by reading our Bibles. We can do it by praying with him and trusting that his promise is there for us. So we're just waiting. He's just waiting for you to come. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending us your son, Jesus. Thank you for wanting to speak to our hearts. Give us ears that are willing to open to hear the amazing things that you want to share with us. Lord, let us come running when you call and sit next to you as you comfort us, encourage us, and lift our burdens off us. Help us to share these things with others and pass on the encouragement that you give us. 
And all God's children said, Amen. today is from Joshua 1, verses 10 through 15. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, ready for battle, must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. The gospel today is from Matthew 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All these things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the end of the lessons for today. Well, it's my privilege to introduce our guest preacher today. His name is Pastor Byron Longenecker. And he and his wife Jess and their four kids happen to be regular attenders here at Christ Lutheran Church. Byron received his MDiv from the Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri back in 2012. And after that time in seminary, he and his family returned to Montana, where Byron was ordained in the Presbyterian Church of America. He's pastored in Billings and Kalispell and currently operates a local small business right here in the Flathead Valley. We welcome Pastor Byron. Well, thank you, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here today to share with you God's word. I've had the opportunity to meet many of you, and perhaps you have met my wife or my four kids, 
And we have really enjoyed our time here at Christ Lutheran. Well, let me pray for us before we begin. Father, I am a sinner and a weak man. We need your truth. We ask that you would help us through this text to fall more in love with you today, we pray. Amen. Well, a little fact about our family. We are suckers for a really good story, especially one that I'm able to read aloud to them. And one, one story that we have read recently is Watership Down. It's a story about rabbits, really written for adults, but it's about rabbits. Rabbits, they're seeking to find a home, a place of security and rest. And what's always interesting as I read stories aloud to my kids is to watch them and who they identify with in the story. It's fascinating. And in Watership, Hazel's the main character, but that's not who they loved. They loved the hero, Bigwig, a gruff rabbit, a fighter. And as we're reading the story, it's fascinating to watch them as they admire his qualities and they begin to put on his character. This aspiring to be like the hero of the story, it's common. We understand this. And in fact, often when we read our Bible, we do this as well. We read of Abraham and his faith, of David and his bravery. And so we aspire to do the same. Unfortunately, though, this approach at times can stunt us to one of the most basic truths in scripture. We're not the hero. We're not the hero. We need help outside of ourselves. And that's the whole gist of the Bible. We need someone. We need someone to go before us, to fight for us. We need someone to save us. As we strive to obtain our place of peace and rest and security, even our most secure places often only provide temporary relief, if at all. Peace and rest always seem to be just just beyond our grasp. And so we need help. Look at your life. Ask your soul, do I need help that can only be found outside of myself? If I can't find security, peace, and rest for my soul, then who can? In our text today in Joshua 1, we see that if we're to receive the promise of God, we must have a leader who will obtain it for us. We approach this true story of Joshua, and at this point in history, Israel is holding on to a very old promise, a 500-year-old promise, a promise that God gave to Abraham, their ancestor. God promised him a people. He promised him a land in which Abraham was currently dwelling in a tent in, and he promised him that his people would be a blessing to the nations. And so for 500 years, The generations of Israel have come and gone, but they have held to this 500-year-old promise. They become a vast people. That's where they're at now, but they do not have a land, a home. A place of security and rest. And Moses, they thought he was their man. He brought him out. He was to take him in. But that was not the case He, along with the rest of the Exodus generation, they died in the wilderness. They're gone. And although Joshua, his assistant, uh, Moses' assistant, was with them for 41 years of wandering, Joshua, too, now is old. He's much, much older than the rest of the nation. And so we see that they're wondering, will he actually be the leader that will help them obtain their 500-year-old quest. Israel is now on the border of of the land. They're at the Jordan. And God, like a father, he's finally giving Israel, his grown son, 
his inheritance. We've seen the last three weeks Joshua's commissioning in verses 1 to 9. God commands Joshua, and listen to this, remind, remember this, go, I am giving, verse 2. He says in verse 3, it's time to receive what I promised. Verse 5, I will not leave you or forsake you. Repeatedly, Josh, uh, God says to Joshua, therefore, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you, Joshua, wherever you go. And then finally, we come to our text today in verse 10. Joshua commands, pass through, prepare, pass over, go in, take possession. Joshua's first action as God's chosen leader is to command the people in exactly the same way that God has just commanded him. In essence, Joshua is saying, take up your possessions and follow me. And where is he leading? Well, in the conversation that follows, he reminds the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, he reminds them of their oath. Moses gave them land on this side of the Jordan. But their oath was to help their brothers obtain their place of rest across the Jordan. And so where's Joshua leading? He's leading them to a place of rest. Now, Corey Combe, he's going to preach next week on the remainder of this conversation. But today, I want to focus us in on the first actions of Joshua as the new leader. And in order to fully understand our text, we have to ask two questions. First, who is this man Joshua? What's his historical significance? And what's his role in this story? And then second question we have to ask is, how does Joshua point towards a greater leader? So first, who is Joshua? Who is this one who has now taken up command? Well, we know Joshua was born in Egypt. He was born a slave. His parents actually named him Hoshua, Salvation. Hoshua. They longed for deliverance from their slavery, as did the rest of Israel. And his name will change later, and we'll get to that. But for now, Hoshua celebrates with Israel in their miraculous exodus and their crossing of the Red Sea. And the first time that we see his actual name mentioned then is in Exodus 17. Israel's there in the wilderness, and a vast army, the Amalekites, come to attack to destroy them. And Moses places Joshua in charge of the army. And he defends against the attacking Amalekites. And they win. And here and in the following battles throughout Exodus and Numbers, we see that Joshua is a victorious warrior. He's fighting the enemies of the Lord. He's defending God's people. Continue on in the story, we see Joshua is Moses' assistant in Exodus 24. Both men travel to the mountain of the Lord where Moses commands Joshua to wait for him while he goes on further to meet God and to receive the law. And so Joshua obeys, and I'm sure it was put to the test. It was quite a long wait alone there in the wilderness, and yet he was a faithful servant, an obedient servant. Keep moving on in the story, and we come to our passage that we know well in Numbers 13. They're at the edge of the promised land, round one. Moses sends in 12 spies, but before he does so, notice this, Numbers 13, verse 16. Moses changes Hoshua's name. He takes the name of the Lord, Yahweh, Yah, and puts it together with Hoshua, Yahoshua. The Lord saves. That's significant. Yahoshua. And so Joshua receives a new name. The Lord saves. But in spite of going into the land of getting a good report, ten of the spies come back with a bad report. We can't do it. 
And Joshua and Caleb, they're the only two that cry out to the people to pursue it by faith. And yet the people rebel. They want to kill Joshua and Caleb to stone them. And so God intervenes. And Joshua and Caleb are the only two that will come to our text today. The only two from that generation to live to see the promised land. Joshua, the Lord saves. He's a victorious warrior. Defender of God's people. Obedient servant. Faith-filled man of God. This was God's leader who was going to take God's people into the promised land. The commission here in verses 1 to 9 are, as John Calvert puts it, this commission gave the people full confidence, full confidence in following a leader whom they saw advancing step by step by step in the path that God had marked out for him. And God in his grace had taken the people and united them to this leader, Joshua. Wherever Joshua was to go, they were to go. Whatever victory Joshua gained, they gained. Whatever uh, Joshua's gain, it was also theirs, and they celebrated. And here's the point. Joshua did the heavy lifting as the leader. The people did the following. It was therefore his divine call, Joshua's divine call, to not only take his people into the promised land, but to obtain it for them. And only as Joshua fulfilled his divine call were the people able to fulfill theirs. I hope from the beginning of this text then that I don't need to convince you of the importance of having a leader who is following God and his divine call. We see in scripture a leader is very, very important. We not only see it, though, we experience it, do we not? We experience it. Anxious hearts look for leaders. And perhaps a politician, a professional expert, a doctor, a pastor, a leader figure who gives a help and a hope that's only found outside of ourselves. Someone who can fulfill expectations and quiet the fears within a person who will help us find rest for the soul. Well, is this a bad thing, this desire? Maybe, maybe it can be. But what if God actually created you to long for an answer outside of yourself? God seemed to think it was important to have Moses to lead the people out. He seemed to think it was important Important to have Joshua command the people and to lead them in. What if you were created to long for a leader? Christ Luther, you're looking for a pastor, a leader. Should you seek out a Joshua? Maybe some aspects of his character, but I hope not overall. I hope you don't seek for another Joshua. You see, Joshua does obtain the promised land for a time. Sure, him and the people, they conquered, but not completely. And years later, Joshua dies, and the people actually turn away from the one that gave them their inheritance. They turned away. They did not take what was theirs. And the fact is, as many have pointed out, Israel got into the promised land, but the promised land never got into them. This Joshua, he simply could not obtain for his people lasting success, eternal peace, a permanent rest. You might be asking, but Byron, you just said we are made to long for a leader. What's the point of having help outside of ourselves if we're only to end up where we started? Good question. 
The point we need to see is that we were made to long for the greater Joshua. If you expect a pastor to obtain all your expectations and hopes, you may crush him. He may sorely disappoint you. Anyone with that would. Again, you were created for a greater leader. So how does Joshua point towards a greater leader? Well, let's not forget who he was. You see, the greater Joshua must be better than the first. He must be a mighty warrior. In fact, he must be completely victorious over God's enemies and the ultimate defender of God's people. The greater Joshua, when put to the test, he must obey perfectly. Even if he is alone in the wilderness. The greater Joshua must be the one who is the perfect, faith-filled man of God, despite bad reports and threats upon his life. And finally, the greater Joshua must be one who obtains for his people not a temporary inheritance, not a temporary place of peace and rest, but one that is permanent, unchangeable. Who could this greater Joshua be? About 130 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Justin Martyr, he was debating with a Jew named Trypho. And Justin, in his dialogue with Trypho, he writes, and he, he just exclaims, how do you not see who this greater Joshua is? And he reveals that when Moses changed Joshua's name, he literally changed it to the name Jesus. Jesus. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. It's a Greek form of the name Joshua. This is why in Matthew 1, Matthew writes, he will save his people from their sins. Joshua's part of the story is significant, both for Israel, but especially for us. God so loved the world, including Israel, that he gave Abraham a promise. And God so loved the world that he calls Joshua to help Israel into the promised land, Canaan. God so loved the world that the story moves on and the promise grows. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the better Joshua, to fulfill a better promise. And this son, Jesus, he was born in this physical land, Canaan, Israel. And in this land dwelled this people. And this historical person, he's significant not only because how God used him in that moment in history, but also because who he points to. Who he points to. And he begins to set our expectations for the greater Joshua to come. Like Justin asked Trypho, I had to ask myself, how do we miss this? How do we miss it? In his excellent book, Stories We Tell, Mike Cosper, he tells about about when he was a teenager and he decided to read through the Bible in one year. And as he read through the Bible, his goal was really to examine each of the heroes. Jacob, Isaac, and more. And he imagined them this way, and this is how he puts it. I imagine them as brawny, fierce, and godly. Part of what excited me about reading their stories was the chance to learn something about manhood and marriage. Interesting for a teenage boy. Mike writes, boy, was I surprised. These men were liars, weasels, cheaters, womanizers, and pimps. The absence of heroes puzzled me for a long time until one day it dawned on me that perhaps this absence was the point of the whole book. 
There are no human heroes, really. Everyone's hands are stained and dirty. Had any of these women actually uh, been what we would have imagined, we would not need the gospel. We wouldn't need Jesus. You see, the call is not to be like Joshua, although there are many, many aspects we're called to, such as being strong and courageous because of God's presence. Yes. But all God's promises to Joshua were because of God's grace and mercy to this man and to this nation. When Joshua takes the command in verse 10, he tells the people, prepare your provision. For within three days you're to pass over this Jordan to go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. At this point, Joshua perhaps had the report of the spies in chapter 2 already. He was armed with the knowledge that he himself could be strong and courageous. Why? God promised him that he would not leave Joshua or forsake him as he led the people. But how? How is it possible that a holy God could promise this man, a mortal, imperfect person, such as Joshua? How could he promise this when he is a perfect judge? He cannot overlook or dismiss sin. Therefore, in order to be close to Joshua and give him full assurance of his presence, and give him the assurance to take up command, God must delay his justice for a greater Joshua. God must delay his justice. And so Jesus, the greater Joshua, we know that he did not have this promise. Have you thought about that? He did not have the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Rather, his whole purpose for coming to this earth was to experience the very opposite. The very opposite. In order to satisfy God's justice, to be able to say upon the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The mission, the divine call, for this Joshua, Jesus, was to fully satisfy the curse. To fully obtain the promised peace and rest for our souls. The place where God walks and interacts and relates to his people again. Almost like it was back in Eden, in the garden. But it's even better. And he did this without that promise. What strength, what courage, what a savior. This perhaps then puts Matthew 11, 27 in a different light. Let me read this again. Of this savior. All things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son, and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's always troubled me. It does not feel like an easy yoke or a light burden. Until I understand that I do not have to do the heavy lifting. Rather, we're called to depend on help and salvation outside side of ourselves. We're called to receive and enjoy the eternal promises of being in close relationship 
with this God. And with that, all the blessings of peace and security and new purpose and hope flow from who you are in this Joshua, Jesus. The one who obtained all this for you. It is out of this then that our anxious hearts are able to respond with freedom. The freedom to love. The freedom to obey. The freedom to glorify God with our lives. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your amazing grace and mercy. Thank you for the story of the first Joshua. And we praise you for the second Joshua, Jesus. Amen. Let us confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is now time to respond in faith by giving up our offering. Hey everyone, it's time for our offering now. And I just wanted to remind you what 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says. Each of you should give according to what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God's work at Christ Lutheran Church continues, regardless of our inability to meet and worship in person on Sundays. So your continued support allows us to bless those in need within our church and throughout the whole community. Yeah, and here are three ways that you can give. You can give through CLC website, clcwhitefish.org. You can also use our app, the Give Plus app. Just download the app, type, tap Find Churches Near Me, and then select Christ Lutheran Church. Then tap Give Now, and then the rest is pretty self-explanatory, and you can call the office if you need help. Yeah, and of course we can always do our snail mail. Just send a check to Christ Lutheran Church, 5150 River Lakes Parkway, Whitefish, Montana, 59937. Right, and we want to remind you that um, giving at Christ Lutheran is an opportunity. It's not an obligation. So we just invite you to give generously, trusting God to bless and use your gifts for the ministry and His glory. Join me in your hearts as we lift up our prayers of the church to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today and for the time we've spent gathering together to lift up your name. We thank you for the word given to us by Pastor Byron today. 
Help us to remember your promises to us, that you are with us, that you have an amazing plan for each of us, and that we can lay our burdens at your feet, trusting that you will carry us through the struggles and be the provider of all that we need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, the world is in chaos, and we need you to calm the storm around us and within us. We pray for fear to subside and for your truth to be what we cling to and trust in during these confusing times. We pray for godly leadership for our nation, state, community, and church to seek you in all things and to make decisions that are wise as they strive to care for those in greatest need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, you are indeed the great physician. So we lift up those in our own congregation that need your healing touch, comfort, and peace. Lord, be with the Jensen and Miller families as they grieve the loss of Don and George. Lord, we pray for healing for Jean's back and Bill's skin cancer. We pray mercy for Cliff and Glenda as both are in hospice care. There are others, Lord, that we know who have major health issues. Bless them with your healing touch and give strength and protection to their care providers. And we also lift up those that are unemployed, insured, homeless, and hungry. Help us to be the church, your hands and feet to those in times of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. And today we're especially grateful for blessing us with mothers who loved us enough to give us life. Help us to honor them today and always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we go with you into the week ahead, Lord, help us to be strong and courageous as you carry out your plan for our lives. Give us a desire to spend time with you in your word, in prayer, and in serving you by loving our neighbor for your glory. And thank you for the cross, for Christ's blood shed for all, so that we can have life with you for eternity. And Jesus, thank you so much for teaching us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, now we have time for just a couple announcements. So I want to thank uh, Pastor Byron once again for bringing us God's word today. And we just ask for continued prayers for the rest of our teaching team as well as they see us through the book of Joshua and this time of not having a pastor on board. Um, we also want to share the good news that um, the job is posted for our senior pastor position and the call committee 
is currently looking at resumes, so continued prayers for that process. It's very exciting. Uh, Parking Lot Church continues along with streaming and the radio, so this is how things will be until we feel safe enough where all can gather in church to worship together. Um, Some small groups are planning to start meeting in-house like Shepherd's Hand, the medical piece of Shepherd's Hand uh, begins on Monday night. Um, There won't be a meal or dental. Other small groups may consider doing that too, meeting in-house, but we encourage the Zooming to continue. So right now, I just want to invite Pastor Byron to do the benediction. Well, the Lord always gets the last word, and this is his word of blessing to you as people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you rest in Jesus. strength when I'm weary, oh my Lord, lift me up when I fall, oh my Lord, light a fire in my bones that an ocean cannot drown, give me hope, give me strength until my work is done. be my vision oh, oh, oh the passion and the fire in my soul we'll keep the banner flying high the banner flying high in the valley of shadow
Jesus be my vision. Oh, 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 the passion and the fire in my soul will keep the banner flying high. The banner flying high. The banner flying high. Let's take the light of Christ into the world. Oh, Jesus be my vision.